you receive the glory and honor from the proclamation of your word this day. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I'd like to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 78 this morning, Psalm 78. It's been a real joy to be able to be here this weekend and spend some time with the men yesterday and then all, all morning today. And I'm just so thankful for your church being part of the G3 Church Network and to be able to get to know your elders and many of you folks a little bit better. Uh, it's always a, a great thing to be able to know how to pray better for the various churches in our network and uh, we ask for your prayers as well as we seek to provide resources for churches like yours and others. And uh, we're so grateful, so grateful for the opportunity to be here. Not going to look at the whole psalm this morning. This is a rather lo long psalm. We're going to focus most of our attention on the first eight verses, but we will dip into a little bit of the rest of the psalm and also uh, look at a little bit of the context for the central message of Psalm 78. We'll begin our reading in verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from, our, from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation." a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. This psalm, Psalm 78, is sometimes referred to as a didactic psalm. It's not a psalm of praise. It's not a psalm of lament or confession. Rather, it teaches us some important lessons. And it does this mostly by recounting certain aspects of Israel's history. Really, verses 1 through 8 are the central message of the psalm, the, the central commands, and that's where we're going to focus most of our attention this morning. But then the remainder of the psalm relates events in Israel's history. But it's important for us to understand that there is a central purpose behind relating that history. And so I want to take a few moments to consider the purpose, the, the background, the context of why Asaph would write this psalm, which is largely filled with history of Israel. What's the purpose of all the history in this psalm? Well, first, I want you to notice the specific subject of this history, and it's first introduced to us in the beginning phrase of verse 9, which comes right after the passage that we read. Look at the opening phrase. It begins by saying, the children of Ephraim. So the history begins with a focus on the tribe of Ephraim, but then I want you to notice where the psalm ends. Look at the end of the psalm uh, toward the end at verse 68. <clears throat> we find here a focus on a different tribe, but he chose the tribe of Judah. Now pause for a moment. Why, at the end of Psalm 78, is he focusing on the tribe of Judah when he had began the historical recounting focusing on the tribe of Ephraim? Well, this is exactly a question that may have been the minds, uh, on the minds of the people of Israel. We today know that the tribe of Judah was the tribe chosen as the source of the kings of Israel. It was the tribe from which the Davidic line came and Indeed, it's the tribe from which the Messiah himself came. But we often forget that Judah wasn't originally the tribe that had the special blessing and status of the Lord. Originally, the tribe of Ephraim had enjoyed God's special blessing. Now, who was Ephraim? Well, Ephraim was the younger of the two sons of Joseph. 
And just before Jacob died, he blessed jo Joseph's sons and he gave the greater blessing to Ephraim. He actually crossed his arms so that the younger son would get the greater blessing, very similar to what happened with Jacob and Esau. Ephraim got the blessing, according to Genesis 48. Ephraim enjoyed Joseph's inheritance. And when the Israelites began <clears throat> settling the promised land, Joshua, who was an Ephraimite himself, gave the most desirable allotment of land to the tribe of, e uh, of Ephraim. It was an agriculturally fertile area in the central highlands of the promised land. <clears throat> and because of Ephraim's special status, and the fact that Israel's leader at the time, Joshua himself, was an Ephraimite, the tribe very quickly began to dominate and become the central focus in much of the book of Judges. The great prophet Samuel was from Ephraim. The region became a political and a military center of the nation. And in fact, the city of Shiloh, which was in Ephraim, was the city that God originally chose to be the center of his dwelling in the tabernacle. So here was the tribe of Ephraim, which had received the greatest blessing from Jacob, the inheritance from Joseph, had been allotted the most desirable region in the promised land, whose central city was the place of God's dwelling in his tabernacle. Ephraim, in the early days of the settling of the promised land, was the very heartland of Israel. This was a people who had received great blessing from God, great advantages, prosperity, wealth, and even the presence of God himself. And so the question is, why, why don't we hear about Ephraim anymore? Why didn't the kings of Israel come from this honored tribe? Why was the tabernacle later moved out of Shiloh, Shiloh to Gilgal? And why was the temple later built in Judah in Jerusalem? Well, Psalm 78 specifically refers to this in verse 60 when the psalm reads, he forsook his dwelling at Shiloh, his tent where he dwelt among mankind. Why did he do that? Why did God do that? And perhaps even most importantly, why didn't the Messiah come from this blessed tribe? Why did the Messiah come from Judah? Why did Judah become the blessed tribe as we read a moment ago in verse 68? In fact, in Revelation chapter 7, when the tribes of Israel are listed out, Ephraim is not even mentioned. Clearly something has happened. And this would have been a natural question for the people of Israel. And this is exactly the question that Psalm 78 is addressing in all of its history. So in getting at the heart of the purpose behind this psalm, it might be important for us then to just take a few moments and consider why this happened to Ephraim. Why did the special status and blessing move from the tribe of Ephraim to the tribe of Judah? Well, I want you to consider first what we find in Joshua chapter 16. This is a passage that recounts the allotment of the land that was given to the various tribes of Israel. And this chapter in Joshua chapter 16 specifically refers to the allotment of land given to the tribe of Ephraim. And verse, fi verse 5 begins describing the boundaries of the land. Again, this is, a, this is a region that is known for its rich soil and fruitful vineyards. But then listen to what happens in verse 10. After Ephraim is given its land, verse 10 of Joshua 16 says, However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer, so the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. You see, the first thing that really led to the downfall of Ephraim is that they disobeyed the clear commands to completely wipe out all of the pagan inhabitants of the land of Canaan. Ephraim failed to do that. They saw a profitable alternative. Why don't we just let the pagans live here and make them work for us? Seems to make more sense. But God was concerned about the purity of his people. 
God was concerned about the purity of his worship. He did not want the people worshiping as the pagans worshiped on their high places using their altars. And so God had commanded the people, completely wipe out all of the pagan people, wipe out all of their sacred places and ways of worship. But as we know, the people of Israel in general, and particularly the tribe of Ephraim leading the way, did not obey the Lord's command. They took really the pragmatic route. Instead of separating themselves from the pagans, they integrated themselves within the pagans. And at first, Ephraim remained dominant over the pagan people. The pagan people paid tribute to them and worked for them. But scripture is clear, when God's people integrate themselves into the pagan world, the values and customs and practices and even worship of the pagans are bound to influence God's people. And that is exactly what happened with the tribe of Ephraim. In 1 Samuel 4, we found, find an account of one of Israel's battles with the Philistines, a battle that occurred in Ephraim between Shiloh and the Philistine city of Aphek. And after losing the battle, the elders of the people suggest maybe we should take the ark with us into battle the next time we fight against these Philistines. Now, where did they get that idea? God had not told them to do that. In fact, God had said to leave the ark in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. No, this idea to bring the ark with them came directly out of the pagan playbook. It was very common for pagan nations to have religious talismans that they would bring with them into battle as sort of a good luck charm. And that's exactly what the Israelites intended to do. They thought that if they took the ark out of the tabernacle at Shiloh and brought it with them in battle, then surely God will help us win. And of course, you know what happened. They lose miserably. The Philistines capture the ark, Shiloh is completely destroyed, and the tabernacle is later moved to the city of Gilgal. And by the time of the New Testament, the descendants of the tribe of Ephraim become what we know today as the Samaritans. These are the people who, who intermarried with pagan people, who integrated pagan customs with their own, and even created a new religious system that mixed the true worship of Yahweh with the pagan practices and rituals. You see, what ultimately led to Ephraim's downfall was a failure to forsake the world. Instead, they integrated into the world and eventually adopted the world's customs and even the world's worship. Look at how Psalm 78 describes Ephraim's problem in verse 10. It says, They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. They forgot the works of the Lord. This was Ephraim's central problem. This is why they disobeyed the Lord, why they lost God's blessing, and why the place of status moved from them to Judah. They forgot the works of the Lord, and so the rest of Psalm 78 is really a reminder of all of the Lord's works that the people of Ephraim had forgotten. God bringing the people out of Egypt. God protecting them through the wilderness and punishing them for their sin and showing great mercy by bringing them back to himself and showing them great blessing and actually blessing them by bringing them to the promised land and driving out the nations from before them. And ultimately, this psalm is a reminder of what led to their destruction. Verse 67 says, he rejected, that is, God rejected the tent of Joseph. He did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. Now, with all of that tragedy in mind regarding Ephraim, let's return to the opening verses of, these, of this psalm. Because these verses provide the key to preventing this kind of tragedy from happening to God's people even today. The psalmist begins Psalm 78 with the solution, with an express command as to what God's people should do to prevent the kind of tragic downfall experienced by really Israel in general over its history and specifically with the tribe of Ephraim. So what is the solution? 
What hope can we have in our day and age to prevent this kind of thing happening to us? Well, look again at verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. You see, the hope, the solution that will prevent the tragedy of Ephraim from happening to us, the hope is found in our children, in the next generation. The solution is to faithfully tell the coming generation what God has done and his wonderful works. And this is a command, this is an emphasis, not just for the parents in the room today, but for the parents and the grandchildren, uh, grandparents, and really for all of us as we consider how to pass on God's word and works to the next generation. This is the best way to ensure the continued faith of the people of God. In fact, this is perhaps how many of us, not all of us, but how many of us came to know God ourselves. Some of you may not have had Christian parents. You came to know the Lord through other Christian influences. But for many of us, our testimony is that the same as what the psalmist describes in verse 3, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We came to know the wonderful deeds of the Lord because our, our parents, our fathers, told us about the wonderful works of God. And that's the key, the psalmist is saying. We must tell the coming generation the wonderful works of the Lord. Now, there's an interesting phrase in verse 4, though. Why would the psalmist say in verse 4, we will not hide them from our children. I mean, who would actually hide the works of the Lord from their children? Why would he say this? The implication here is that Ephraim did exactly this. Ephraim hid God's word from their children. And folks, there is a similar danger even for us today. Certainly not purposefully. Certainly we would never purposefully hide God's works from our children, but there are ways in which we could inadvertently hide God's word and works from our children. Let me suggest a few ways that we might actually do this. First, oftentimes parents assume that it is the responsibility of other people to do this. We're going to talk in a moment about the importance and blessing of pastors and Sunday school teachers and others helping to pass on the word of the Lord to our children. There's there's an importance in that we'll talk about. But many times parents think, well, that's being taken care of. I don't really need to do that. Maybe we make sure to bring our kids to church, but not much more. But notice that this command in this psalm to tell the coming generation the wondrous works of the Lord is given primarily to fathers, not to priests, not to elders, not to judges, not to prophets, as important as those individuals were in passing on to the next generation. The command here is given primarily to the fathers. Our fathers have told us, and therefore we must not hide these things from our children. This was a command given to the fathers, to the parents, in the context of families as part of the great Shema of Deuteronomy 6, the great confession of faith of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That's the great confession of faith of Israel, but then notice what comes next. And these words that I command you shall be on your heart and... You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The word of God needs to permeate our families. And of course, this is the emphasis also of the New Testament. Fathers, Paul admonishes, 
Bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The command is not primarily given to pastors, Sunday school teachers, youth leaders, as important and valuable as those are. We'll talk about that in a moment. No, the command is first and foremost given to fathers. It's given to parents. Telling the coming generation the wonderful deeds of the Lord cannot be passed off to anyone else, parents. It is our responsibility. We must make this a regular, faithful part of the everyday lives of our homes. We must make sure to pass on God's word to our children, lest our children forget. But here's another way we sometimes hide the things of the Lord from our children. I've found that there's sometimes a danger for those of us who rightly recognize the problem with sort of manipulative evangelism tactics that are often used with children. It's unfortunately the case in many churches, and we rightly are worried about that. We don't want to manipulate our children. We don't want to assume that just because our children are in our homes that they'll automatically be converted. We're right to not assume that. that that's not an assumption we can make. And we want to make sure that we don't manipulate them to make a false profession of faith just because they want to please us. We don't want to give them false assurance. Okay, so, so far, so good. That, that's a good thing to caution against. But sometimes in the name of being careful not to manipulate our children into making a decision, well-meaning parents sometime actually, sometimes actually pull back and don't faithfully evangelize their children. I've noticed that we are sometimes more fervent in our evangelism towards people outside and even children outside the church than we are to the children in our own homes. Parents, how will our children call on him in whom they have not believed? And how will our children believe in whom they have not heard? And how will they hear unless we tell them? We must regularly, faithfully tell our children the things of the Lord, warn them that they are sinners and in danger of eternal judgment, that the only way of salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ, and whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We need to compel our children to repent and believe in Christ with just as much fervency as we do with other unbelievers. And though we should absolutely be careful not to manipulate our children, not to give them the idea that just because they have Christian parents or that they attend church that they're Christians, we have to be careful of that. It is nevertheless absolutely true that our children do have a spiritual blessing because they're in our homes. And we ought to take advantage of that. God has ordained that for our children. He's put them in our homes for a reason. This is one of the reasons that there is a clear pattern in biblical history and most of church history of families emphasizing family worship every day of the week. Fathers, you need to be leading your family every day of the week in reading the Bible and in singing and praying together. It doesn't have to be long or complex, but give your children the word of God. Teach them the wondrous works of the Lord. As we'll talk about here in a moment, Things that happen on Sunday or other times in the church, Sunday school classes, youth classes, these sorts of things are wonderful benefits to teach our children the wonderful works of the Lord, but they need it every day of the week. They need it in our homes. We cannot pass this off to others. But then there's a third way that I think sometimes well-meaning Christians often hide the things of the Lord from their children. And again, it's rooted in a otherwise correct belief we, we believe in the perseverance of the saints, right? We believe that if someone is truly saved, they will persevere. That God, God will never, nobody will be able to, 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 to pluck them out of Christ's hand, he said. That's true. That's a biblical doctrine. But then sometimes we have a sort of cavalier, fatalistic view of the world when we just throw our children out into the pagan world with the assumption that, well, if they're elect and if they're saved, then they're going to persevere. But the problem here is the same. It is true that if our children do come to Christ, they will remain in Christ. That is true. 
But just like with conversion, God not only ordains who will be converted, he also ordains the means of their conversion. And in the same way, with preservation, perseverance, God not only ordains the fact that his chosen people will persevere, he also ordains the means of that perseverance. And one of the most significant means that God has given to his chosen children to protect them and guide them is their parents and their church. We need to have a realistic assessment of the world in which we live, folks. Our land is just as pagan as the land of Canaan. We don't see altars and people bowing down to false gods and people sacrificing to idols and these sorts of things. But actually, if you think about it, that actually makes the paganism of our culture perhaps even more subtle and dangerous. It's why we sometimes don't recognize the danger of just indiscriminately, without any discernment, just letting our kids out into the pagan world. But those pagan influences are just as dangerous and there is a lion prowling around seeking to devour the souls of our children. We need to protect them. Secularism is a pagan religion and it has infected everything in our modern culture. Entertainment, education, music, politics, there's no neutrality. We have to be on guard against those elements of our culture that are aiming at our children to pull them away from Christ. And each of these things of, in, in what the New Testament calls the present evil age is working to undermine Christian values and Christian beliefs. Remember, this is exactly the problem that Ephraim fell into. They didn't separate themselves from the world. They didn't recognize the dangers there. And many times we do that as well. This is exactly what Psalm 78 is warning us about. At very least, we need to consider, e even if our children are converted, even if they have already come to faith, we need to view them as weaker brethren that need to be protected. Why would we, why would we cause them to stumble by sending them out into the world with no protection? Among those who, whom Christ said hate him and hate his people, those, those who are actively working against them, we need to protect our children. We need to guard them, guide them as they are in the world. But then a fourth way that we may hide the wonderful works of the Lord from our children is by not making sure to faithfully integrate our children into the body of Christ. Yes, it is our responsibility as parents primarily, but parents, we cannot do it alone. God has given us the wonderful gift of the church in which our own lives are sanctified and disciples and the, the, the benefit of our children being brought to Christ and discipled and sanctified. Yes, parents are the primary ones responsible to bring children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, but if we try to do it alone, we are doomed to failure. We need others in the body of Christ. We need godly pastors. We need other mature Christians in the body to come alongside us and help us as we seek to teach our children the wondrous deeds of the Lord. Keep in mind that these commands in Psalm 78 are not given just to individuals. They're given in the context of the community of Israel. Notice what he says in verse 5. God established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. Yes, it was the parents' primary responsibility to tell the, their children God's law and works. They had to do it as they sat down in their homes and lied down and all those sorts of things throughout the week. But these were laws and works given to the community of God's chosen people and it is within the community that God's God's people and, and parents should bring up their children to know the Lord. Remember, here we have a psalm that does just what it commands. It reminds people of the wondrous works of the Lord. But, but notice who wrote this psalm that recounts the, 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 the history of Israel and in what form it was given to us. Who wrote this psalm? Asaph. Asaph was a Levite. 
one of the chief musicians serving in temple worship. And so this is a recounting of the work of the Lord meant to pass on God's truth to the next generation, not just in the privacy of the home, but in the context of the community of God's people in the temple. You see, when we remove our children from the community of God's people, we are removing the necessary means God has given to parents to help them tell their children the wondrous deeds of the Lord. There is no better place for us to tell our children the wonderful deeds of the Lord than for them to witness and hear and experience the goodness of the Lord in the corporate gatherings of God's people. Parents must raise up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, but within the community of God's people, the local church. And let me make a comment here for a moment for those of you whose children have already left the home or perhaps you don't have children. Please welcome the children. Seek for ways that you can minister to the children in this church. Remember that the way that you treat the children in this church impacts and shapes their, their view of the church and their view of God and their, and, and their view of one another as part of the body of Christ. You have an influence on the children of this church whether you know it or not. Let them know that they are valued. Share with them a word of encouragement. Help these young parents who need your help as they wrestle with these bottled up blobs of energy. They need you. They need your encouragement. Now, all of this has been sort of grim, right? Warning. Doom is coming. The world is attacking your children. We need to protect them. Don't hide God from your children. The psalmist does give us those warnings. Those warnings are important. Those admonitions are necessary. Don't hide God's word from your children lest they fall into the destruction of the tribe of Ephraim. And when we consider the world in which we live, the increasing paganism around us, the hostility to Christianity that's growing at an ever-increasing rate in our society, and even the fact that many of uh, people who claim the name of Christ are compromising, are following the path that Ephraim followed and integrating into the world and adus- adopting pagan customs and pagan values. When we see all of that, we might be tempted to despair, right? I mean, just think if things continue in the world in the way in which, we, in which they are going, what kind of world are my grandchildren going to be living in? It scares me a little bit. We're tempted to despair. But actually, the psalmist does not intend for us to despair. That's not the point of the psalm. He does warn us. He does faithfully recount the ways that Ephraim fell into destruction. But I want you to notice his goal. What is his aim? What is his heart's desire in admonishing us to tell our children the wondrous deeds of the Lord? Look at verse 6 so that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. You see, Asaph is listing here several benefits, several results that come when parents and churches in general are are certain, are sure, are, are, are working hard to make sure that they tell their children the wondrous deeds of the Lord. What will happen? Asaph tells us. First, when we faithfully pass God's word to our children, it helps us to cultivate what I'm going to call a God-fearing tradition. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, notice what's happening here in verse 6. When we tell the next generation God's works, then that generation comes to know God's works, and then they tell their children, and then their children tell their children, and on and on and on. We are setting a pattern We are establishing a tradition of passing along the wondrous works and faithfulness of God to the next generation. 
This reminds me of 2 Timothy 2.2, where Paul says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able then to teach others also. That's what I mean by a God-fearing tradition. A pattern that is established and cultivated and perpetuated through each successive generation of remembering God's wondrous works and word. And, and here's the really powerful thing that establishing such a tradition enables. The longer that it is cultivated and grows and is established, the harder it is to forget. Even if one generation drops the ball and fails to actively tell the previous generation the things of the Lord, a cultivated tradition of telling God's works provides the means by which maybe the next generation will pick it up again and continue telling the next generation the things of the Lord. This is the beauty and power and importance of good, sound tradition. Things like good hymns and good biblical teaching and good books and good customs in our churches and in our homes that faithfully embody and teach the wondrous works of the Lord. I mean, think about it. We benefit, do we not, from many previous generations of cultivating those sorts of things. We don't have to come up with just new songs. New songs are good, but we've got things in our tradition. We've got books and sermons and theologians and customs and practices, all of which have been passed down to us so that even if a generation forgets, the next generation still has that, that stuff to be able to help pass on God's works to the next generation. And when we faithfully tell our children the wondrous deeds of the Lord, not only does it create a tradition that perpetuates that knowledge, but notice the results that Asaph lists in verse 7. So that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. Now, I want you to notice something very important about the way that Asaph describes this result. This is a result in three parts. Do you see the three parts? And, and what is included in these three results, I think, is very important and instructive for us. It helps us to know how we ought to be communicating these things to our children. And so let's look at these three results. Let's begin with the third one at the end of verse 7. They will keep God's commandments. That's really our end goal. We, we want children who will keep the commandments of the Lord. We know that, that keeping the commandments of God is what will bring Him most glory. If you love me, keep my commandments. We want children who obey the Lord. And not only that, we know that keeping the commandments of the Lord is what is best for our children. That's what's going to bring them blessing. Disobeying the Lord just brings heartache. We want our children to glorify God with their lives. We want them to thrive. We want them to succeed. And we know that the only way that will happen is if they obey the Lord. That's, that's the goal result. But what is necessary before they can obey the Lord? Well, they have to know the Lord. They have to know who He is and what He has done. They have to know His works. And that's the second benefit that Asaph lists here, not forget the works of God. This is why it is so critically important that we faithfully teach our children God's word. Our children need the word of God. Fathers, read the Bible to your children. Mothers, read the Bible to your children. We need the, the word of God in, 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 in our children's minds and hearts through the ministries of the church. Our children need the Bible. They need to know who God is and what he has done and what he expects of them. If forgetting the works of God is what led to Ephraim's final destruction, then we must be certain that that does not happen with our children. Give your children the Bible. But notice in this threefold result that intellectual knowledge about God and his works and what he requires is not enough. Fueling everything in verse 7 is that our children will set their hope in God. This is critically important for us to remember as we seek to lead our children to Christ and disciple them. We must 
absolutely teach truth to our children's minds so that they know God and his works. We must teach our children's wills so that they know what it means to obey God. Unless they know who God is, unless they know what God, what God expects, they cannot please him. But we must be concerned ultimately to teach not only our children's minds and not only our children's wills, but also their hearts. That's where hope is found. Our hearts, the seat of our desires, the seat of our affections, our hearts are what really drive us to follow what we know in our heads. There are a lot of people who even grew up in Christian homes and have heads filled with theology, but that's not enough to make them follow the Lord. They need hearts that hope in God, hearts that love God. Our children may know who God is and they may know what God expects, but unless they love God, unless they desire to please God, unless they have set their hope in God, they won't follow God or obey Him. And when the pressures of life arise and the allurements of this world grow strong. And it's not merely intellectual assent to God's truth or obedience to His commands that brings Him ultimate glory. What brings God ultimate glory is love for him. Believing in him and obeying him, but because we love him. And that's what we want for our children. We need to teach our children's minds. We need to teach them with truth. We need to tell them what is expected in God's law. But we need to be sure to cultivate our children's hearts for God so that they can set their hope on him. So how do we do that? How do we set their hope on God? How do we shape their hearts? Well, this really is one of the most powerful, important functions of worship. Both in our homes and, and in the context of corporate worship in our churches. The didactic elements of our worship help to teach our children the works of the Lord and what God expects, the lyrics of the hymns, the scripture readings, the preaching, that, that all does help with teaching our children the works of the Lord and, and, and how to obey the Lord. So we need that on Sunday. We need that every day of the week in family worship. But there are other elements of our worship, the poetry of the hymns, the music, what we might call the aesthetic elements of our worship that are meant to shape our hearts and that help to shape our children's hearts. This is the power of worship. The power of worship helps to form and shape a holistic view of who God is intellectually and with our wills and with our hearts. And this is why it is so important, parents, that you have family worship in your homes and why we need to make sure that our children are being formed in their minds and their wills and their hearts in church. But second, concerning ourselves with our children's hearts, is also one of the ways that, one of the reasons we need to make sure to guard them from the things that are influencing their hearts. As the proverb admonishes in Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flows the springs of life. There are so many things in this world that are shaping the hearts of our children in subtle but dangerous ways that we often don't even recognize. The music we listen to, the music we let them watch, the books we let them read, the friends they spend time with, all of these things are in very subtly, subtle ways gradually shaping the hearts of our children. We Christian parents are usually very careful about the, the, about the things that are influencing our children in certain respects. But we need to be careful in all respects. What is shaping your children's hearts? Guard them. Protect them. If we desire children who obey God, then we need to make sure that they know God and that their hearts have been shaped by the word of God. 
And ultimately, that's what Asaph is after here in Psalm 78. God has established a testimony for his people. He has appointed a law for his people, which he has commanded our fathers that they should make them known to our children. Asaph doesn't want future generations of God's people to fall into the destruction like Ephraim did. Rather, he wants future generations of God's people to hope in God and to experience rich blessings from God, blessings like those that he granted to another tribe of Israel the tribe of Judah. Look with me once again at verse 68. The shift has occurred in this psalm. Ephraim is no longer in focus, and instead, verse 68, but God chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loves. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth which he has founded forever. He chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds, from following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. Asaph wants the people to experience the blessings of God. Don't we want that as well? The way to do that is to make sure to pass this on to our children. Unlike Ephraim, God loved and blessed the tribe of Judah. He rejected the tabernacle at Shiloh, but he built his sanctuary in Zion, the temple of Jerusalem. He punished Ephraim's descendants, but he chose David, the son of Judah. He cut off Ephraim from leading his people, but he brought a son of Judah to feed his people. And most wonderfully of all, as we especially celebrate at this time of year, God brought the Messiah the Savior of the world, a son of David, a son of Judah, to redeem his people from their sins. Folks, this is the message of hope. This is a message that is extended to us today, that if we and our children and their children yet unborn put their hope in the Messiah, son of David, son of Judah, then we will be blessed forever. Let us commit once again today don't hide God from your children, even in inadvertent ways, but rather tell to the coming generation the wonderful deeds of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would admonish us from your word this morning through your spirit, convict us once again to be intentional, and intentional about how we are passing your word to the next generation. To not just assume that others are doing it, but to give them your word intentionally every day of the week and especially bringing our children to your, your house, your church on the Lord's Day and other opportunities during the week. Help us to be intentional. I pray that you would help those whose children have grown or who don't have children, that they would see that they, they also have an important role in this that they need to stand alongside the parents of this church in helping to raise up the next generation. Our desire is that you might be glorified. Our desire is to experience the blessings that you have promised. And so help us to recognize that this is the means to do so and to be intentional about it. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. time of our